You're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast, practical wisdom for everyday life inspired by the ancient tradition of Stoic philosophy from Greece and Rome. I'm your host, Justin Vakula. Visit my website at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. This is episode 105, Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. I speak with M. Andrew McConnell about his recent book in the episode title. We talk about using time wisely, overcoming adversity, humility, finding fulfillment, and much more. M. Andrew McConnell is the founder and CEO of Rented.com, the leading provider of technology tools and services to help vacation rental professionals optimize their portfolio of properties. He's also the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. Prior to launching Rented.com, Andrew founded Vacation Futures, Incorporated, and Rented Capital, LLC. Before striking out on his own, Andrew was a management consultant at McKinsey & Company and a director, solutions design at Axiom Global Incorporated. A former member of the U.S. national team in open water swimming, Andrew received his A.B. in history from Harvard University, his J.D. from Harvard Law School, and his L.L.M. from the University of Cambridge Trinity Hall. Find more information in the show notes. On with today's episode. All right, I am here today with Andrew McConnell, author of the book, Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Justin. It's great to be here. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. And can you tell listeners a short elevator pitch regarding your book? Yes. So Get Out of My Head is premised on this concept of mind ownership versus mental tendency. And mental tendency is our default state as humans, where we tend to give our mind away to other people, to events and circumstances outside our control. And then we're just left as tenants with the remnants of what's left. And the the sad reality or positive reality is the one asset we ever can and do own is our mind. Every physical asset we hold on to temporarily, our body we've learned can get sick and hurt. We don't fully control it, but our mind is in our control. And yet we default to giving it away. And so get out of my head is drawing on the evolutionary biology and scientific principles to understand why our brain operates in this way, and then gets into stoic principles on what are the remedies to address it and take back that ownership of our single and greatest asset that we own. Yes. And you make many parallels with Stoic philosophy in your book. How did you find Stoicism? How did that become important to you? Yeah, I I think like a lot of people, I probably heard meditations referenced a lot. And you certainly hear quotes from Seneca, um, whether it's Closing Time, uh, the song that was very popular when I was in high school (laughs) and, and other places. But I think it was through Ryan Holiday and probably him through Tim Ferriss that I really got much more into going back to the Stoics and reading those source documents and thinking of it not as just some old guys writing philosophy thousands of years ago, but some wisdom that actually is very beneficial and applicable to my life today. And yes, many practical applications, as you've alluded to, you talk about the dangers of giving away our time and mental real estate away too freely. And Seneca talks about this, that maybe people would be very careful about their money, but people aren't very careful about their time. So there's a discrepancy there that he and you both find. Yeah, I think because it's visible, right? Our money, we can see on a stock ticker or bank balance or physical possession, we can hold on to this golden nugget and think it's more valuable because we can touch it. And because we can touch it, anyone else can touch it. It can age and degrade and break, or people can take it away. Even if you're a Russian billionaire, your assets can be taken away. And so because it's, I think, easier to see and easier to hold, we fight like hell to hold on to that stuff. And yet the the one thing that is finite and that is our own is our mind and our time. And that is something that we just profligate with and give away without often thinking about the the consequences or what we really want in the first place. And, and so that's 
that really is a launching pad for a lot of what the book takes on. And in many cases, the time might be seen as even more valuable than money because we only have so much of it. It's, it's not renewable. And many people will go about their lives. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. But then later on, they, they've squandered that. They've, they've never taken that opportunity. They've postponed what they wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, time is pretty definitionally. I know there are people trying to extend it out with health span, lifespan, but it is pretty much a bell curve on you, it's some finite period, maybe gets to 100 a little more, but you have a very small, small period of time on this earth. And material possessions or uh, accolades or anything else, it's more of a long tail distribution. You can have almost infinite of those. And so they matter much less, and yet they get a disproportionate amount of our headspace. Yes. And with money, as you've talked about in your book, people will have startups, they'll have ideas about what they want to do. And in some cases, people can fail or a business plan doesn't work out, whatever failure might be thought of. But someone can always go back to the drawing board, they take a risk, and then they just go back to what they were doing before, maybe try a new venture and try to replenish the money. But time in many cases can be. You know, it's interesting The what is the worst thing that can possibly happen? And that is death, right? Like that is the end of the game. That is the end of all of it. And it comes for all of us, definitionally. And so if that is the worst thing that could happen, then having something that's quote a failure or not is not the worst thing that could happen. But getting to that final destination and looking back and saying, man, this was my one shot at life, at being here, and I never lived the life I wanted to because I always put it off or I was always worried of the consequences. And that is wasting that finite, precious resource, which is your time, which is your life. Yes. And you, you've engaged in some risk taking with some business ventures that you've started. Maybe it's a personality thing that some people are willing to take the risk, try something new, whereas others can't seem to get out of a mold of maybe working a standard nine to five, working for someone. Um, what, what advice might you have for people to take some risks? Maybe they won't have their own business, but maybe they can take some risks in, in other areas of life. Yeah, I mean, I, one, I think I would reframe the concept of risk. I, I think people say, oh, it's so risky to go start your own business or go do this or that, but or even go to an early stage company. But if you follow news cycles, I mean, you see big companies laying off 10,000 people, 20,000 people, X percent of its workforce. Just because you're going to a big company doesn't mean there's going to 100% be security there. I think that's, we lull ourselves into this false sense of security in the first place of just because it's big. Yeah, maybe the company will be around, but that doesn't mean we'll be there with it. And so we always kind of bury our head, think, oh, it won't happen to me. There's another piece of the flipping of what the risk is. Is the risk that I do X and it doesn't have this specific outcome? That doesn't mean it was a, a failure. You know, a lot of if you want to go to tech entrepreneurs, a lot of tech entrepreneurs, the, the first one doesn't work. And most of the founders that have created, quote, unicorns, you know, these private companies valued at over a billion, they're on their third or fourth venture. It wasn't their first one that was the huge success. There was a learning journey and investors typically know that. And they kind of invest in the entrepreneurial learning to, to go along and continue that. For a personal perspective, the other side of that risk of is the greater risk doing something and not having that outcome maybe you thought you wanted on the front end, or is the greater risk going through your entire life and not pursuing the things that you really wanted? Because again, this is that one life. This is that one opportunity to live the life that you want. And if there's a time that you want to do it, that time has to be now because definitionally we only ever live in one time and that time is now in the present. The future is only in our imagination. We only can imagine the future. We can't live in it. And the past, same. We can't live in the past. We can only kind of replay movies in our mind of it. But the only time we can and do live is the present 
right now. And so if there is that life you want to live, you, you have to actually live it, not just imagine it. Right. There's a hopeful stride, I think, within stoicism that it's saying, hey, we could change our circumstances. Hey, we could have goals in the future. And maybe our goals at first could be modest. We could take some small strides, whereas, OK, well, we can't say, oh, well, I'm going to lose 50 pounds overnight. Right. That's, that's an easy example there. But maybe some people can take some smaller steps on the way to accomplish their goals. And a little bit of change is better than just giving up or remaining in the current situation. Many people will stay in relationships and be miserable. They'll stay in a job and be miserable. They just don't want to change their situation, afraid of risk, afraid of change, whatever the situation might be. But maybe there's an argument against that current situation if it's not leading to flourishing and happiness. Yeah. I mean, it really is working back from that goal. So the the Stoics would say, don't be attached to results, right? Same as Buddhism or Taoism, the, the non-attachment uh, concept. But that, that doesn't mean don't have goals, don't have objectives. And you can have them of, hey, here's the thing I want to work towards and, and should work towards. But there's one side and flavor of that that becomes paralyzing. Oh my God, 50 pounds. That's so daunting. I can't possibly do that. But if you just work back from it and come back to, okay, what needs to happen in a month? What needs to happen in a week? What needs to happen right now today, right? Do I just need to go put on my running shoes and go out for a 10 minute jog? Cause that's 10 minutes more than I jogged yesterday. And that's going to start putting me on the path. And so not lowering your standards for what you're trying to achieve, but lowering the bar for what needs to happen to, to be that first step of the 10,000 mile journey that is where the Stoics really would come in because your, your thoughts, your words, they don't mean much. Action really is the only thing. So you have to know how to act and then do it. Yes. And that's being intentional about your use of time as, as you write in your book, that it's not just having an idea. It's having some foresight, having a plan, having some kind of blueprint to work from. Yeah, I mean, saying that we can and do only live in the present isn't to say we shouldn't think of and plan for the future, or we shouldn't look back and learn from the past. Both of those things are valuable. It's just in doing it, they should be proactive decisions on when and how much time and mind share we want to give to each of those time periods versus the present. And so studies of mostly Americans, but find that people spend 47% of their time thinking about something other than what they're doing. So defaulting to living half of your life, not in the present is probably not what any of us would design on the front end. Maybe it's, Hey, I want to think about the future to make sure I'm headed in the right direction. 10% of my time, maybe it's 5% of my time. I, the past, I really want to learn from it. Again, maybe it's 5, 10, 15%. But the rest, I really want and will live in the present because that is the gift of now. Right. Maybe a lot of distraction, maybe a lot of noise surrounding us or us creating our own agony, as you write, to not agonize about what you have to do before <laughs> you do it. Uh, people, people might just get in that loop of, oh, well, I don't want to do that because that's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. Or what if this happens? What if that happens? Yeah. I mean, this, I, I was fortunate just as a child, it was a lesson my dad taught me when I was like nine years old of, I'd been at a, a friend's house playing all day and my dad came to pick me up and said, how was the day? And I was like, you know, it, it, it was a Sunday. And I was like, it, it just wasn't that great. Cause all I could think about was that at the end, I'm going to have to come back and I'm going to have to do all this work, and put this report together. And, and my dad just stopped me and said, don't either do the thing or don't do it, but don't spend your time not doing the thing, worrying about it, right? It, you're, you both wasted. You didn't use the time to do the thing you, you wanted to do and need to do. And you didn't enjoy the time that you decided not to do the thing in the first place. So on the front end, make the decision, Hey, I'm going to go do this work and put my mind there. Or I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go do this other thing. And I'm not going to have my mind on the work. I'll put it on the work when I go do it. But this idea of just letting what you're not doing ruin what you're doing 
is is a fool's errand. And so to say that I learned the lesson at a young age is not to say that I'm perfect at implementing it, but it it is something I, I go back to quite frequently. Yes, and the Stoic authors remind us that life isn't always a picnic, that there are going to be some certain chores of life, chores of life or things that we don't quite want to do, but things that we need to do. I mean, does anyone really looking look forward to, oh, let me check my bank accounts and pay bills and uh, take out the trash and <laughs> some of these other things, but maybe we'll just try to be cheerful while doing it and not let the future chores upset us. Yeah, I think that is, you know, there are a lot of career advice articles or there are speakers out there, follow your passion and you'll be happy all the time. But I mean, regardless what your passion is, there's going to be administrative work to it, right? Regardless of what your life is, there's going to be administrative work, even just on a personal hygiene, like you're still going to need to floss. That is a thing you still need to go through. And recognizing that not every single moment will be bliss. You can be present and find uh, hopefully some, some joy or something good out of what otherwise would be mundane, but you can't get rid of and shouldn't get rid of those very normal daily activities that are part of what it is to be human and to live. Yeah, so we can make some steps to try to make those things a little bit better. Maybe, oh, well, I'll listen to a podcast that I really like while I'm doing these chores or while I'm taking the jog outside, I can put the headphones on, right? Try, try to make it a little bit better. We can try to enhance that experience in some way. Yeah, I mean, that, that reframing of what the activity is, is a hugely powerful tool. There was a, a friend who was a professor at University of Texas. You know, Austin traffic has gotten worse and worse and worse. And he said he used to just dread his commute. And it was this, the worst part of his day. And he'd be in a bad mood when he'd come home. And he'd be in a bad mood when he'd go to work. And he would just sit there and just stew. And then he found Audible and podcasts. And now he looks forward to it because he's like, oh, man, you know, I've stopped right at this really interesting chapter. I can't wait to dive back into it. And it reframed his time and his view of what that time was spent doing. My my roommate from college, similarly, he, he had a child before I did. And his tip was, you know, when I would get up with my son to do the night feedings, I wanted to be in a positive mindset instead of just dreading it and being really in, a, in an angry mood. So what I did was every single time I would get up, after I'd feed him, I'd give myself a spoonful of Talenti gelato. And he said, it, it made him pop out of bed. He was so excited because he had the treat coming. And he said, you know, the downside was I did put on 10 pounds, but, you know, it was this, it was this great mindset shift. And I think there are things like that, that it's as much the story we tell ourselves about the things we're doing is the things that we're doing um, that become important because it's, you know, going back to, to Shakespeare and Hamlet, it's, there's neither good nor bad. It's our mind makes it so. And we get to decide how we tell that story. Yes, and the Stoics talk about that as well as uh, external things are indifferent to us. And okay, we well, guess it, it could be nice that we have this feast or maybe we get these fancy shoes, but these things aren't essential to living the good life. It's, it's our own mind, as you've mentioned earlier, and our ethics, our morals, our principles that are of paramount importance on the Stoic view. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's... As you said, the, the external events are indifference in terms of how we should view them, but they're also indifferent to us, right? The, the sky didn't decide to rain today to, to mess up your outside event. It just rained, right? That was the story. And whether it, quote, messed it up or not is just your perception of it. Um, I think back to our wedding, it had been... We were in Atlanta, it was October. I mean, it was sunny and warm and hot. We're all outside all week. And then the day of the rehearsal dinner Thursday, a huge storm came in, poured rain and dropped the temperature 20 something degrees. And we had this entire outdoor wedding plan. And we did the ceremony outside. We did dinner outside and just say, okay, let's, we have this other inside place. We're going to go do dancing and go up there earlier and do the toast and everything. And we just rolled with it. And the, the story was, wow, the, the photos were amazing because there's steam coming up 
off the table onto the food and these these pictures of me putting my jacket around my wife around her uh wedding dress and then we had a great time dancing inside but you could see an entirely different story being told of oh you know the weather and it ruined our wedding and everything we had planned but it's it's back to that non-attachment of we care about the process, the process of having a great day together. And what that looked like specifically was less important than that we enjoyed it and made the most out of it. Yes, making the most of situations is things won't always go the way that we intend. Some people can go in with lofty expectations and, oh, it must be this, it must be that. And yeah, you know, with, with weddings, we've seen all these, or heard, at least heard about these reality shows where the bridezillas mm-hmm. or all the plan they're screaming at planners and it's, it's just a big mess. And, and no, it doesn't have to be like that. Right. And just being able to kind of step back enough to say, what is, what is it we're after in the first place? Is it needing to follow in this exact path and order and look like this exact picture at the end, or is there a broader purpose we're trying to serve? And getting into the, those deeper questions of the whys and the what's to, to not lose sight of it. Because I mean, I think we can use what's easy to see and easy to measure as proxies for the thing that we're trying to achieve or pursue. And then over time, we lose sight entirely of the things that we were trying to pursue in the first place. And so, yeah, I mean, for, for me personally, one example. I started studying Mandarin because my daughter was studying Mandarin. I was like, oh, well, this would be a neat thing. We can spend time. We can study together. We can speak to each other. Maybe we can one day travel together and do this. And then I can find myself at times because I'm in Duolingo and it needs to be the, the streak of days that I'll think about pulling my phone out and doing that instead of going and spending time with my daughter. And I have to go back to, wait, it's not the Mandarin that is the goal here. It's the time with my daughter that's the goal. So don't let this proxy of measurement that I, I put in place get in the way of the thing that I'm trying to achieve. Yes, and, and related to that, you write in your book to be aware of our desires that getting a certain thing won't necessarily won't necessarily bring lasting happiness. So maybe, yeah, you had this idea, oh, I'll learn this language, it's all going to be great, but then if we're losing sight of the real goal, then that could be a problem. Yeah, I mean, that, that's twofold there, right? Losing sight of the, the real goal is where you're kind of trekking through the snow and you looked up to, to have your marker and then you just look down in front of you and you're going off an inch each step and you don't look up and realize you know, a couple of days later, you're several miles off course. That could be a problem, right? Losing sight of what is the goal that you're trying to achieve in the first place. But there's a whole separate piece getting back to kind of the biological foundations for why our brains work this way of hedonic adaptation with humans. And so we have pretty much a base level of happiness, contentment, fulfillment, whatever you want to call it. And so we have this idea that when we get X, whether it's we get our degree, we get this promotion, we get a salary of a certain amount or some car or new house, whatever it is, then at that point, we will be happy. We will have what we want or need. And there's there's one piece of modern society that that's never going to end because we're always innovating and coming out with new things, right? Like if someone told you in 2005, what you would get from an iPhone, you would say, wow, there's nothing in the world I would ever need more than that thing. And then now we're on what generation 13 or 14 and people just keep getting new ones because I need that new other feature that it does. So that's one, a treadmill that, that never ends, but there's a separate piece of it as well that we do get that spike of happiness when we first get that car or that house or that phone or the promotion. And then because we have this default baseline level of happiness or contentment, we just slip back down to that. And so the, the most kind of notable or extreme cases of this and studies of this are studying lottery winners years after the fact and paraplegics who had accidents that paralyzed them um, years after the fact. 
and the lottery winners were much less happy than they expected to be. Everyday events and occurrences were far less rewarding to them and had this kind of lower baseline level of happiness. And the paraplegics it was the exact opposite. They were way happier than they expected to be. And that's where this happiness, this contentment, this fulfillment, it really comes from that gap of what we expect and want and what we get. And so someone has a horrific thing that happens to them and their expectation is very, very low. And the reality is just not nearly as bad. And someone gets you know, the new car and they think, oh, this is going to be amazing. But a weekend, two weeks in, month in, that's just their every day. It's no different than the old car. They just start to take it for granted. And then they start looking at the, the next thing. It's that hedonic adaptation for better or worse. And the Stoics in many ways advocate for a frugal life to say, hey, don't have such lofty wants. And what, you're going to spend all this time to make money and then you're going to use the money towards these things that really aren't going to provide you that lasting happiness. And maybe being able to save more of your money will give you more peace of mind and just having fewer wants. And it's not to say live on the streets and live a life of squalor. It's more of looking for a middle way of being reasonable with your expectations and being careful with how you're spending your money and time. Yeah. The, I mean, there's so much in that. One is the more things you have, the more things you end up worrying about, right? The, the super wealthy people that I know, how much time goes into their tax planning and estate planning and trust planning and all these things that the rest of us just don't have to think about like that. That is an extra cognitive load of just having to think about things and worry about things that just you would not otherwise have to worry about. The other piece I, I think that you were getting at is there are kind of two root, routes, routes to happiness or to wealth. And that is thinking, oh, I'm going to be happy or wealthy when I get all these things. The reality with that is as soon as you get those things, it's just like climbing a, a mountain in the Himalayas where you just see a higher peak as soon as you get to that peak and it doesn't stop. You get the yacht, but that other person has a bigger yacht. And then you get the next one and that other person has a bigger yacht. It is a never ending game of what you're going to need to be content. The other and far easier way to get to that quote richness or contentment or peace is to just start subtracting from your wants. And if you do that and just say, wow, I am so happy and content and fulfilled with what I have. I mean, each morning when I sit and I meditate, I really remind myself, it does not cost a cent. There is not another thing in the world I need to be able to do this right here to literally just be able to sit and have an empty mind doesn't require anything else. Same when I go swimming, right? It's a swimsuit and a pair of goggles. It is the most basic thing. There's nothing else. And those two activities in particular, I think, cause it, uh, I'm human like everybody else. You can see something and start craving and wanting it and then going back to wait, no matter what else I had, I would still choose my time to do these things that take nothing, that require nothing. And so really distilling down and getting back to subtract from those desires, subtract from those cravings, and you can get that contentment, that richness, that wealth today. All right. Very good. And you're listening to the Stoic Solutions Podcast with host Justin Vakula. I'm here with Andrew McConnell, author of Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. And to move on to another topic, you talk about criticism, that some people might want to avoid criticism, they feel uncomfortable with criticism, but you think that engaging with critics can be a gift, helping you get closer to the truth. Yeah, I, I think the, the quote that is most often cited on this, especially in American culture today, and everybody loves, I mean, even Brene Brown has a book um, pulled from the, the speech is Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena speech of it's not the critic who counts. It's the man in the arena that's actually doing the deeds and, and doing the work. And the Stoics would, I, I argue, have a, a different take on it of it is in your power and it is your responsibility 
to make the critic count because the criticism is coming from somewhere, right? Take away what you perceive their intent to be, uh, perceive them trying to do or say, and get down to what is driving that quote criticism because criticism itself is just a label we're putting on it. They said or wrote or did something and what is in there that you can take away from that will help you on your path to being better because there was something that drove them to providing that critique. And if you're able to do that, then regardless of if they're malicious or not, and none of that matters. What matters is, hey, is there some kernel of truth in there that I can unlock, that I can now go pursue and improve myself and my life as a result? Yeah, I, f I find it interesting that people not open to the criticism at all. As my background, I, I play poker, and a big part of being a better poker player is accepting that kind of criticism and saying, okay, here's this hand, here's how I played it. Would you have done something differently? Like, here's me actively looking for feedback and... More recently, I appeared on a televised game and mm. everybody was able to see the whole cards after the fact and talk about the hands. I was able to send the video to friends and I thought, wow, this would be a great learning experience. Whereas maybe others would take the thing of like, oh, no, I don't want to hear it. It's just my way I play. It's just my idea. Right. Like some some people saying that there's really no truth. Oh, it's all subjective <laughs> is like some way to uh, deflate criticism. And OK, there, there could be like matters of taste or subjectivity in some areas. But in many others, that's that's not always the case. Yeah. It, one that I, I hear a lot in kind of the work environment when you talked about, oh, that's just the way I play of people having negative reactions from colleagues or from clients or others. And they say, oh, well, this is just who I am. I say, oh, well, that's who maybe who you are now, but can you also recognize the impact who you are now is having on other people? And is that the person you want to be? And, and you may decide, sure, that is the person I want to be, but back to that just asking the question of, can I be still be true to myself without being abrasive and being harmful to other people? It, right? it, it's not the extreme of, hey, I can't speak the truth because these people are too sensitive. There, it may be how you present it. It may be when you present it. Telling someone they're an idiot in front of a whole bunch of other people may not be the most effective way to accomplish what you're trying to achieve in the first place. So these excuses of, oh, this is who I am. Maybe it, it sounds like we just come from more of a mindset of that's who I was. And the question is now, is this who I want to be? And if I'm trying to grow and improve and, and be better at this thing called life, then perhaps that's not who I want to be going forward and how do I through this criticism digging into this kernel of truth start to work towards something better yes and especially in a collaborative environment you're going to have to make some concessions especially with a team of people or even just a partnership or relationship business partners like okay there's going to be some disagreement there's going to be some personality conflicts eventually probably but how, how can you take the higher road in some cases? Or how can you be more constructive with feedback rather than just being abrasive or name calling? We are social beings. We operate in a society and we operate with other people. And so thinking of them doesn't have to come at the cost of ourselves, just as caring for ourselves doesn't have to be at the cost of doing right by others. Yeah, and I know, I know personally some criticism was a good thing when I was getting started with credit cards, miles points, travel rewards, loyalty programs that people put me in the right direction where I joined some online groups and Slack channels and started listening to podcasts and the advice and some feedback that I got from people pointing me in a better direction was extremely helpful. So it's like, yes, please, you know, give me more on this. Like, I want to learn more. Like, you, you have to be uh, open to that feedback and criticism and having this idea that, yes, I, I want to be learning from this rather than, oh, I'm just going to go in and say the way I think it is, even though other people who have been more experienced in this space know better. Yeah. So some humility uh, is a good aspect of it. 
humility and that humility then breeds a curiosity, right? I think the examples you gave on the points on the, on the poker side, you go in with this mindset of, Hey, I really want to learn and get better. And I think there are a lot of people that go in and say, Hey, I want more feedback at work. Give me more feedback. And what they really mean is I want praise. I want you to really praise me. (laughs) And if the feedback is not focused on praise, they, their hackles go up. They have a very difficult time or an impossible time actually receiving the feedback to grow. But if you instead get in this mindset, like you were just describing of, I'm really interested in getting better at X could be poker, could be points, could be making Excel spreadsheets, could be my way of giving presentations, could be in my writing, but I'm going in really trying to learn how to get better and knowing no matter how good I am now, I can be better. And this process is going to help me get there. Then it's going to be so much easier and more natural to to desire and seek out and receive that feedback, even when it's not the most cheery and always praise oriented. Yes. And it's having some reasonable expectations about ourselves and that, okay, we're not going to be the expert in every domain. There's some people who have more expertise or more awareness of a certain thing. As you've talked about in your book, it made sense for you to delegate responsibilities to others in your business ventures rather than trying to take on everything yourself. Yeah. I mean, I really do try to think of my life and try to help others think of their lives in terms of a a two by two box and not just because I was a former consultant and everything kind of goes to a two by two box, but this spectrum of things that I really hate to do with my time and things I really love spending my time on, on one axis and the other axis, things I'm really good at and things I'm not. And the more of my life that I can spend in the top right box, the more of the things that I can move to the top right box to get better on, the better my quality of life is. The more that I can take things that I'm not very good at in the first place and put them with someone who's better, the better off my clients, my team, my company are. And so being deliberate about what are the different activities that need to get done and who is the best person to do it, me or otherwise, and finding better people to do it, that very much is is my job as a CEO. Right. You're probably not going to sit down and code something from the ground up for a payment processing service, but hey, oh, we know Stripe exists, or we can take payments through this or that, and we'll pay the little fee or maybe have a person in a department take care of that. Yeah, that was was a, a learning early when I was starting my first company. I was thinking, you know, here are these 20 different things that we have to build from the ground up and and be great at. And a more experienced entrepreneur came to me and said, absolutely not. You need to be the world's best at something. What is the one thing no one else is doing or can do that you're doing? Because all these other things, people do this. And so you don't need to be good at it. You can just hire them. You can just buy on a subscription or whatever it is. And that's kind of the brilliance of, Amazon Web Services. And hosting servers and managing servers is not core to anybody's business. It was a utility people had to do to get to their business. And Amazon said, look, we're doing it at such a scale. It has become a core competency and part of our business. What if we can fractionalize this and let other people access it? And that's where their profits all come from now because they, they did it. And that's where a ton of startups have been able to succeed and launch incredibly efficiently and build very valuable businesses because they didn't have to focus on the things that were not true core competencies to the business. It helped to allow for more focus on what that core competency had to be. Right. People can get hung up on, oh, I need to do everything myself and I need to be part of the process all the time. And that's just not realistic, especially if you're going to be running a bigger business. And even in everyday life, okay, we're going to go to a physician, we're going to pay someone to do an oil change, or, you know, we're going to do these things to make our life easier in some case and not take on too much ourselves. Yeah. Mess it up too. Like, I I think it was one story you were talking about, you had some home repair, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you you spent all this time trying to like, look up how to do it. 
But over time, it's like, oh, I could have just found someone to do this work for maybe like 30 or $40. And <laughs> that was a lot better than like the four hours down the drain. It, it's exactly true, right? It, it One of the things that people, that story one is true. I was, a, I was a consultant. I was spending my weekends doing something that I was terrible at, I hated, and I was doing a bad job at. And hiring somebody that took a few minutes to do what had taken me days to not do a good job on was 100% the right answer. And the the reality is, I think we in some ways are getting better at this, right? There's less and less DIY uh, happening on uh, certain generation, which a lot of people lamented of, oh, these people aren't doing all this housework themselves and handiwork themselves. But then you look at where the time's going and it's largely going to spending that time with their family, with their children, with their family, with their friends and saying, well, that's, that's incredibly valuable time. That's the, that time on the weekend, teaching your child to ride a bike is once in a lifetime. You don't get that again. And to be able to just hire somebody who is better to go do the yard work or whatever it is so that you can get more of that time. That seems like a trade-off, at least I personally would make a hundred times out of a hundred. And so, sometimes uh, when we have all of our plans, we have everything in rows, things are ine- in a row, inevitably things are going to go wrong. And, and you write that we can try to play out some of these worst case scenarios ahead of time to prepare ourselves and not be so shocked when things don't go the way that we expect. You don't want to be an ostrich in the sand with your head in the sand, just pretending nothing's ever going to go wrong. And you also don't want to be the uh, chicken little, always worrying about things outside of your control, running around crying and, and worrying. But to the extent you can proactively, this gets back to that question of how much time do you want to spend living and having your mind in the future versus the present to proactively think about, hey, what could really derail X, right? Going back to the wedding example. We have this whole outside plan. What would happen if the weather changed and having a backup plan? If you're a business, okay, what would happen if a global pandemic hit and our revenue <laughs> dropped by 80% in a week? What would we be able to do? And you can't plan every single kind of scenario, but thinking through, hey, what are the big things that could go wrong? And then working back from that of, okay, what could we start doing now to lower the risk that that would happen or put ourselves to be in a better position should that happen is different than worrying about it. If you just thought about, oh man, that's a terrible thing that could happen. Man, an asteroid could hit us and that would just be really awful. And I'm just going to not enjoy any day going forward because there's that risk out there is very different than thinking through, okay, well, then I really want to spend my life as an astrophysicist and building a better telescope and and going and doing something about it, if that's something you really care about. Um, And so that's where the Stoics say, live in the present, but think and plan for the future. Don't just worry about it, but actually plan so that you're better positioned for when those things come. Yes. And perhaps there's inspiration that we could have from our past in revisiting times where we face challenges and prevailed. You're right that that's a good thing to look back, that that could help us for the future to have some gratitude for the times that that we've done well, that we've gotten past this difficulty, as some people might say, oh, this is a new thing. This is a new thing. But eh, maybe not. Maybe we're able to use those skills that we've used in the past to prevail when there are challenges or will be challenges. Yeah, I think everybody's much stronger than they give themselves credit for. They're still here. <laughs> but by virtue of the fact that if they're listening to this or if they're living, they, they're they still here. They got through whatever life had thrown at them to this stage. And the fact that you're still here, you've overcome some stuff. And being able to think through, hey, those lowest of the low points. Yeah, that, that was really rough. And what came after that? What future high came out of that? What did I learn from that experience? What did I get from that experience? It may have helped contribute to that future high. And how can this current low that I'm in, or there's some future low that I'm hitting, how can I think about what I learned from those past times 
to help put me back on a trajectory to get to yet another high. All right, very good. We're coming towards the end here. Are there other things from your book that you'd like to introduce into the conversation? I don't, I mean, the the book in general, right, it's not just the the idea of Stoic philosophy and the, the biology behind it. It really is structured in such a way to provide tactical exercises and worksheets. So it goes from the heady aha of, oh yeah, this really clicks and makes sense to action is the only thing. Now it made sense. Now what do I go do differently as a result? And I think the tendency with books like this or, or with reading like this is you finish something, you think, man, that, that really resonated with me and made a lot of sense. You put it down and you go pick up another one and nothing necessarily changes. So I, I would just encourage people not to just kind of speed through, but um, really, really dive into the exercise because the reason I put this out there and I put this together is these are things that I've implemented in my own life that have really made an incredible positive difference for me. And to the extent they can help you and help your life, I, I, I really hope you, you put them in place and, and share your journey with me. I'd love to hear how it's going. Yes, and I like that about the book. It's not just theory. It's not just uh, ideas, but they're just practical approaches for overcoming certain challenges. And with criticism, you, you had this idea of taking time, reflecting, identifying, echoing, and deliver. So you're, you're giving people some steps in order to try to break things down and conceptualize scenarios. Yeah, and, and each chapter has exactly that kind of thing. So work, whether it's a worksheet or it's an exercise or it's a practice, it really tries to take, okay, this concept makes sense in theory. What does it mean in practice in my own life? And it's not necessarily you have to start at chapter one and finish chapter 13, but it's what is the thing that maybe you're having a hard time with today, you're struggling with today that is clicking and just starting there back to lowering that bar to get started. Just start with one, just start with one and it will make a difference. All right, very good. And that book, once again, is Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom by Andrew McConnell. Great. Thanks, Justin. Yes. And anything else you'd like to share with listeners? Any upcoming projects, current tasks, anything about your business or businesses? Yeah. So I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of a company, Rented.com. We are the pricing engine behind vacation rentals and Airbnbs uh, to help people better manage their pricing there. And then if they're interested in connecting uh, with me, it's best is probably on LinkedIn and my website where I put my blog up and access to a lot of the materials is just M is in Michael, M Andrew McConnell.com. And that's where a lot of resources will be found as well. Okay. And if you could spell that out for listeners. Yeah. M is in Michael. It's my, my first name is Michael. So it's just M Andrew McConnell.com. So M A N. D-R-E-W-M-C-C-O-N-N-E-L-L.com. All right. Very good. I'm sure a lot of uh, different spellings of that last name could be in play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, it, every other letter is doubled in the, the last name. So double C and <laughs> double L. All right. And that's rented.com. R-E-N-T-E-D.com. Correct. Yeah. That's the company. All right, and I'll aim to put that in the show notes as well for listeners. Thanks. All right, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Justin. Have a good one. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more content. See the show notes for more information and links surrounding topics discussed in this episode. Support my effort through my Patreon page found at stoicsolutionspodcast.com. Access special perks, including having upcoming podcast guests answer your questions, custom-made podcast episodes, and private one-on-one -on -one calls to discuss whatever you'd like. Visit my other podcast at hurdygurdytravel.com. That's H-U-R-D-Y-G-U-R-D-Y travel.com to learn how to make money, save money, and travel the world at next to no cost with credit card rewards, deals, and loyalty programs. Use affiliate or referral links to support me at no extra cost to you. Thanks to generous patrons and fans of this podcast who help support my work. Have a great day.